The year is 2013 and a group of students are on a school trip. However, it is no ordinary school trip because when the sun sets this day, their lives will have transformed forever as they are getting ever closer to perhaps one of the most profound and horrific places on the planet, Auschwitz-Birkenau, a symbol of the worst moral atrocity in recent history. For it was in the shadow of the Second World War that millions of individuals were murdered in what is now universally known as the Holocaust. In this short documentary, we intend to explore the Holocaust as well as anti-Semitism in general, in the hope that we may prevent such events from taking place again. The city of York, England, one of many cities to witness an anti-Semitic pogrom. On the site of the current Clifford's Tower, 150 Jewish persons died in 1190. The Jewish population had sought refuge in a castle after townsfolk formed a mob to wreak havoc upon the Jews of York. Here they committed suicide. They died by their own hand and retained their faith rather than be forcibly baptized or killed by the mob. Only a plaque remains on the mound of Clifford's Tower to remind visitors of what occurred on this site centuries ago. As a society, we like to think that we are continually making progress in furthering social equality. However, history demonstrates all too often that social progress is a two-way street. Anti-Semitism would intensify centuries later. Nottingham Trent University lecturer Bill Niven explains. I think most scholars would agree that in the course of the 19th century with the emancipation of the Jews once they were economically integrated to a greater degree, become part of society, Western European society to a greater degree, there were still some restrictions but there was a, a degree of emancipation and once they'd become as it were members of society uh, no longer distinct or different from others, then, especially if they'd converted to the Christian religion, the only way you could distinguish them as Jews was through a racist argument, that they were somehow different in their character, in their essence, in their makeup. Uh, and so for those who were still convinced there was a Jewish conspiracy, they couldn't argue it on the basis of religion, they couldn't argue it on the basis of their being marginalized because to a large degree they were integrated. The one argument they could still advance was oh, but they're different to us, they're essentially different, they have different genes, and that the whole thing eventually became biologically and racially underpinned through a ridiculous set of philosophies and theories. Ridiculous to us, but they were taken seriously, right into National Socialism, and we see, of course, what the result of that is in the Holocaust. In Europe, the Holocaust did not start immediately after the National Socialists came to power in Germany, it was, in fact, a gradual process rather than an instantaneous event. They introduced various laws restricting the rights of Jews. One such example was the Law for the Protection of German Blood and German Honor, introduced in 1935. Moved by the understanding that purity of the German blood is the essential condition for the continued existence of the German people, and inspired by the inflexible determination to ensure the existence of the German nation for all time. The Reichstag has unanimously adopted the following law, which is promulgated herewith. Marriages between Jews and subjects of the state of German or related blood 
are forbidden. Marriages, nevertheless, concluded are invalid, even if concluded abroad to circumvent this law. Annulment proceedings can be initiated only by the state prosecutor. Extramarital intercourse between Jews and subjects of the state of German or related blood is forbidden. Jews are forbidden to fly the Reich or national flag or to display the Reich colors. They are, on the other hand, permitted to display the Jewish colours. The exercise of this right is protected by the state. It forbade any kind of sexual um, intercourse between Germans and Jews. It forbade marriage between Germans and Jews. Um, there was another law, of course, passed at the same time about citizenship regarding Jewish citizenship, which of course made it impossible for Jews to become German citizens or to retain their German citizenship. Um, it was no longer possible for Jews to keep German housekeepers under the age, uh, sorry, servants under the age of uh, 45, I think, uh, in their homes, uh, or to fly the German flag. Um, the laws on miscegena miscegenation required, of course, I suppose, some kind of definition of what constituted a Jew, and that's why the various addenda then to the new Nuremberg Laws were developed, and it was um, as a result of these that the Nazis came up with this notion that if you had three Jewish grandparents, you were a Jew, a full Jew, a full Jew, and then various categorizations of half-Jews, or considered to be a Jew, Geltungs, you would have quarter Jews, and so on. Um, but of course they were very, very hard to systematically maintain. Life in Nazi Germany for the Jewish population gradually became worse, and Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass, resulted in a series of attacks on Jewish businesses and property, and at least 91 people were killed. From the beginning of the Second World War, however, Jews in Nazi-occupied Poland and other Eastern European countries became the victims of Nazi anti-Semitism. At this point, we're going to introduce you to Simon Winston, a Holocaust survivor. He was born in a town called Radzivilov that was part of Poland and is now in Ukraine. Many of the Jews in Radzivilov worked in the grain industry. They were prosperous and got along well with their neighbors. However, events would treat the Jews of Radzivilov cruelly. My name is Simon Winston. I was born in 1938 in a small town called Radziwilow, which at the time was in Poland. Um, the town of Radziwilow had um, about 20,000 people, of which 7,000 were Jews, which is quite a large proportion of Jews, but we got on fairly well with our neighbours. Very quickly the Germans entered our town and they made it quite obvious that they didn't like Jews. A few months later, the Germans ordered all the Jews, all 7,000 of us, into the market square. When we got there, we were told to sit on the floor. And suddenly, a group of about 20 Nazi machine gunners popped up, and they pointed their machine guns at us. And we thought, this is it, they're going to kill us. And people were screaming and crying and wailing and praying. A high-ranking officer came in his car, he came out of his car, he waved his arm, the machine gunners put their machine guns away and they left. We were then ordered, that's the Jews were then ordered to go back to our houses. When we got back to our houses, we found that they were empty. The Germans had stolen all our belongings, everything, our valuables, but also furniture, tables, chairs, but we needn't have worried, because a few months later, the nice, kind Germans, they built a new home for us, a ghetto, a prison. Well, I think what's often forgotten is that when the Nazis invaded Poland, um, they set up uh, a series of policies that didn't just affect Jews, but also affect between Poles and, and Germans. And one of the big things Himmler wanted to do was to bring in 
Germans from outside, uh, for instance, from the Baltic states. Um, agreements have been made with the Soviet Union to enable Germans to be resettled from areas which then fell into the authority of the Soviets. And so Germans were to be moved into occupied Poland. And as a result of that, Poles were moved out and Jews were moved out. There was, of course, a desire to remove, to deport Jews anyway, independent of this process, but it was very much um, initially, at any rate, influenced by that. And so ghettos were set up as holding camps to hold the Jews um, until, I suppose, something had been decided as to what was to happen to them. Initially, they were to be deported to Lublin, and then there was a hope they could be, um, with the Madagascar plan in 1940, shipped off to Madagascar if the British were defeated, which of course never happened. And so they became gradually long-term fixtures, which was not initially how they were intended. Um, but they started off as a, an interim solution, not as a final solution. But all of the Jews had to pick up their bits and pieces and go trudging along to this new area called the ghetto. When we got there, we found that the whole area was surrounded by newly constructed walls and barbed wire, lots of barbed wire. The ghetto was also divided into two halves. There was a road going through the middle of it. Ghetto 1, that was for the useful Jews. About a thousand people went into Ghetto 1. They were the, the young, the healthy and the strong. Uh, and thank goodness that's where my parents went because people in Ghetto 1, they were being sent out to work. Anything from 8 to 12 hours a day, 7 days a week. Slave labour. But at least when they came back, they were rewarded with food. Enough food for my father to go into Ghetto 2 and give some of his food to his parents, my grandparents. In some cities there already existed Jewish communities uh, and so areas could be taken over where the Jews already lived and turned into ghettos. In other cases they were, um, they had to be more or less created on the spot. Um, but they were of course run by the National Socialists. We know too that they allowed some degree of self-administration in some of the ghettos. And we know that that, of course, then raises questions about the complicity of Jewish councils and so on in these particular ghettos. But let's not forget, it was the National Socialists who set them up and who ultimately controlled everything that happened there. People in ghetto too were not getting any food. They were deliberately being starved to death. The food was in very short supply. Um, over time, of course, sanitation became worse and worse. People were living in very, very cramped conditions. Disease became rife. Um, it meant a slow death. They ordered all the Jews out of Ghetto 2, 2,000 of them, into Waldman's Yard, as my father just names it. And that was a, a works yard next to the Grand Synagogue. Um, when they got there, the men were separated from the women. About 1,000 men were then forced marched five miles into a nearby forest and when they got to their destination, they found that there were two huge pits already dug. The pits were covered in lime. The men were ordered to take off their clothes and put them on a nice neat pile and go and stand around the first pit, which they did. They couldn't argue. They were skeletal. They were like zombies. And they were shot dead and their bodies fell into the pit. A group of Ukrainian soldiers then buried them. Those same Ukrainian soldiers were then ordered back to Waldman's yard to fetch the women. And just like the men, the women were ordered to march five miles into this clearing in the forest. And when they got to their destination, they also had to take off their clothes, put them on a nice neat pile, and go and stand around the second pit. And they too were shot dead, and the bodies covered over very quickly. Initially, as you probably know, the killing was done by, by means of shooting or execution squads so when the Nazis invaded Poland. Uh, So-called task units or Einsatzgruppen were involved in, in shooting of, of, of Polish civilians as well, of course, as, as of Jews. Uh, and when the Nazis invaded the, the Soviet Union, um, a number of so-called Einsatzgruppen task forces, task units, followed in behind the Wehrmacht and carried out large-scale killing um, of partisans, Bolsheviks and Jews, increasingly in fact of Jews and then also of women and children. But the actual systematic killing of Jews at annihilation camps 
um, started a little later. The Nazis took over the technology, if that's the right word, that they had developed in the euthanasia killings. But increasingly, Himmler realized that another method would need to be developed, and that method um, was gas, but then Cyclone B, uh, which of course we know from Auschwitz. We know that was a, a horribly efficient method responsible for the deaths of millions of people. From the Nazis' point of view, it was a clean method. They didn't have to face those that they were killing directly. They even got others to remove the bodies, other prisoners. So it was a form of killing in which they dissociated themselves effectively from the victims, cut themselves off from them. Um, efficient, yes, from that point of view, an industrialized murder. Um, the word efficient is one I find very difficult to use in this context, um, simply because it suggests you're doing something um, mechanical, practical, even something that needs to be done. From the Nazi point of view, of course, that's exactly what the case was, and efficiency was achieved through these methods. But for us, that very idea of it being efficient says so much about the Nazi system, so much we find difficult to understand and difficult to accept. Um, so it's perhaps a good choice of word, efficient, one which provokes thought, makes us think about what National Socialism was and what it means to us today. The situation for the Jews of Radzivilov was worsening every day. Some form of action would need to be taken to ensure their survival. After this horrendous massacre where 2,000 Jews were murdered by the Nazis, there were only 500 Jews left in Ghetto 1 because a lot of Jews were being sent out on work duties from Ghetto 1 and they never came back. Um, also, we'd heard that all the other towns and cities were now becoming Judenrein, Jew-free. They'd killed all the Jews living there. And we were afraid that Radzivilov was going to be Judenrein, made Judenrein. In other words, that we would get killed. And that's when people started to make plans to escape. It wasn't going to be easy, because if you did escape, where were you going to hide? What were you going to do for food? And you needed papers. Well, to that end, my father, who was a very pragmatic person, had made plans even before the ghetto was built. What he did, he sold most of his valuables and used the money to purchase small bars of gold, eight ounces each, today worth about 10,000 pounds. And the very first gold bar that my father would have probably used would have been one to bribe a Nazi guard on the outside, a German Nazi guard on the outside, to allow us to escape, and he did. So we went to this uh, bolt hole of a house, but when we got to the house, the woman came out and she said, please don't ask us to hide you because the Germans have been, they've threatened us, they've warned us if they find any Jews, we'll kill the whole family. And then she gave us some good advice. She said, you want to go to Brody, which was a small town near Rajivilov. She said, because they've killed all the Jews in Brody, there's no Jews living there no reason why the Germans should be looking for Jews there. But she said, you'll have to cross the river. There was a river separating Brody and Rajivilla. Um, Don't cross the bridge because the bridge is being manned by some Ukrainian Nazis. So we went downstream. And we, as we walked downstream, I remember, this is the first time I actually remember something because I remember my father did a right turn and he walked straight into the river. And he started walking across the river until the water got up to his shoulders. And by that time, he was already halfway across the river, so it didn't drown him. And he was able to come back for each one of us, me, my brother and my mother, and carry us to the other side of the river. And now we were free, but soaking wet. We know there are cases of people who did manage to escape from the ghettos, as they managed indeed to escape from some concentration camps, but the outlook for most of them was pretty bleak. Uh, we know of cases where they joined up with partisans, there are such stories, um, but uh, the stories that I know particularly uh, involve um, Jews who escaped from ghettos but then eventually got captured again. I know of one particular case too where Jews were able to hide in surrounding woods, 
I know cases of people who lived in ghettos but hid their children outside the ghettos so that they would escape the attention of the SS um, in, in one or two cases with Polish farmers, for instance. So there are these stories, but by and large, your chances of survival were not very good. Simon and his family would have a long road ahead of them before they could truly be free. But for those who remained in the ghettos, a terrible fate awaited them, either in the concentration camps or death camps. The camps themselves, though, evolved over a period of time. They were used initially to um, incarcerate political opponents, communists in 1933. Um, there are the so-called wild concentration camps. These were set up uh, by the SA before the um, system under the SS was, uh, became more systematic. Um, and initially it was political opponents of all kinds, but particularly social democrats and um, communists who suffered. In the course of the 1950s, uh, sorry, course of the 1930s, other groups um, found themselves in the concentration camps, notably Jews, particularly as of Kristallnacht in 1938 where a large number of Jews, I don't know, it was between 30 and 30,000 perhaps, were held in Dachau and Buchenwald particularly. And at that time, the idea was not to kill them. Uh, the idea was to put pressure on them to emigrate. And in fact, uh, the in the case of those Jews who were in Dachen, uh, Dachau and in Buchenwald, um, once they had pledged to leave the country, they were then allowed out of the camps. Um, in the course of the Second World War, of course, it wasn't just Jews who were held in the camps, the concentration camps in Germany, but also um, prisoners of war, um, others, other international citizens too from around, around the European countries that were occupied by the Nazis. And the concentration camps essentially are not seen as death camps. They are regarded as distinct from, say, Auschwitz or Treblinka. But it's a difficult distinction to hold, particularly in the final months of the war where uh, Jews were dying like flies, let's be honest, um, or were being evacuated in large numbers and dying as a result on the death marches. Um, but the distinction, I suppose, is generally considered to be one between holding prisoners as a concentration camp and annihilating them at annihilation camps. Auschwitz itself is probably the most infamous of all the Nazi death camps. Today, the Auschwitz camps attract many visitors. Some come here for remembrance on a March of the Living. Others come here to learn about the horrors that occurred in this place. And there are some survivors who have walked through the Auschwitz gates who visit to remember their own suffering and that of their Jewish brethren. Simon Winston visited Auschwitz years after the Holocaust. The first time I visited Auschwitz, which is probably the most profound place in the world, the most horrible place in the world. Two years ago, I actually saw the whole of Auschwitz and everything that happened there. And I was uh, very fortunate because I went along with another survivor who comes to speak here quite regularly, Kitty Hart Moxon, who actually stay, had um, lived and stayed in Auschwitz for a year and a half. And she had some horrendous stories to tell. I went to Auschwitz many, many years ago. I can't clearly remember what I saw. In fact, most of my students have been there more recently than I have. I, I hate to admit, but it's true. And I always encourage them to go. Um, but I have been to Buchenwald and Sachsenhausen more recently. I did quite a bit of research on Buchenwald, so it was there very often. I think what surprised me also about Dachau was the absence of traces more than anything. Um, it struck me that um, when you see pictures of concentration camps, you see you see huts, you see barracks, you perhaps see people as well. Um, although we don't have that many pictures of the camps, but there are pictures at Buchenwald of the roll call area with with thousands of prisoners standing around, and you go there and there's just silence. There's just an echo of the past, but the past itself seems to have gone. There are exhibitions, um, there are memorials, and all of those, of course, help to make you aware of what happened there and uh, help you too to mourn if that's the purpose of you coming. But there's still a huge silence and a huge gap because most of the artifacts simply are no longer there. The, 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 the barracks and the sheds and so on and the, the SS buildings very often are gone. And they've been replaced um, in Dachau, for instance, to a degree by various religious buildings. Um, and that struck me particularly. I wondered why there were these buildings 
um, because surely Dachau was not about the Christian faith. Uh, so why were these, why was there a chapel of reconciliation there? I think a Protestant chapel. I mean, of course this has to do with coming to terms, but it puzzled me at the time that I was there because I didn't think it had a, a right to be there somehow. Um, so that struck me, yes, th th this silence, this, this absence really more than anything. In Auschwitz alone, it is estimated that more than one million people died here. As for the Holocaust itself, the genocide ensnared approximately six million Jews. But even up until the end of the war, the situation for those Jews in hiding was grim, and some tough decisions had to be made by those people if they were to survive. And probably the best hiding place of all was the third one, the last one, because it was in a barn and we hid in the cellar underneath the barn. And because it was a barn, we could come out in the daytime because the barn had windows. And also, the cellar of the barn was much bigger than the hiding places in the, the bunkers. So we had more room and my father was able to invite some of his friends and his relatives to join us, those who were looking for hiding places. And in the end, we had eight to 10 people staying in that last hiding place, the cellar. And one of the people who came to our hiding place was my mother's brother's wife. She was on the run with her husband, but her husband sadly was caught by the Germans and killed. Um, and she was on the lookout for a hiding place. And when she found that my father had a hiding place for her, she was overjoyed and she came to join us. But when she came to join us, she uh, was pregnant. And after about three months, she gave birth. And the baby started to scream and cry as babies usually do. And the farmer heard this and he was very frightened. He told us to get out. He was worried about his own family. And we had to make a terrible, terrible decision. It was that baby, that child, or 20 other people and that child. Sadly, I have to report that that child was suffocated. I only heard about it really 10 or so years ago when someone, a descendant, wrote a book about it. And the saddest part of that story is if that child would have been born just three months later, it would have survived. Because three months later, the farmer opened the trap door, I remember this, um, and the sun was shining, and he uttered three words in Polish, which I didn't understand. He said, you are free. I didn't know what that meant. I thought I was going to live like this for the rest of my life or get killed. And my father did ask him, what's happening? He said, the Germans have left, the Russians are back. And sure enough, that was the case. The farmer even said, you can go back home now. Well, my father did try to go back to our house, which by now was about 20 miles away. But he came back and he told us, we can't go back to our house because it's owned now by a Ukrainian family. And no way are they going to let us have our house back. For those Jews from Poland, for instance, there was the question as to whether they would want to return to Poland. Uh, there are cases of Polish anti-Semitism after the war, the notorious case of Kyrgyzstan in 1946. So one decision they had to make was where they wanted to go. Um, there was also, of course, a limit on where they were allowed to go. There was the question about which countries they could go to. Israel only became an option a little later. It wasn't an option in 1945 or 1946. Um, and for those Germans, of course, those German Jews particularly who had survived, uh, the question was even harder because Germany was surely unthinkable as a new country for them, as a new home for them. And yet many of them did stay or came back later in the 50s and 60s to set up a new life there. Um, but for many of them, of course, the whole issue of trauma was not addressed at the time. It's only perhaps in the last 30 years that we've become aware of the traumatic effect of the Holocaust. At the time, the Jews were just one of many displaced people. Um, their fate, of course, was known to be a particularly bad one, but they were not necessarily regarded as essentially different to many of the others who had suffered in the Second World War and who needed to be rehoused. Um, in the case of the Germans, for instance, they were arguably more concerned about where to rehouse refugees from Eastern Germany who had been expelled by the Soviets, uh, Poles and Czechs than they were concerned about the Jews.
Um, that only changed very gradually, I think, in the course of the 1960s and 1970s, that the Holocaust as a phenomenon became uh, something that seemed distinct from the rest of the war and worthy of, therefore, special attention. The very first time we came to, to this country, uh, there was prejudice, um, instant prejudice. I, I felt it in school, uh, in primary school and secondary school, because, um, um, you see, there were no minority groups here of note. There, there were hardly any black people and hardly any Asian people. Um, but there was a very large minority group of Jews. There were about half a million or so Jews in Britain. We'd been here for centuries. And because there were no racist laws in those days, people were allowed to poke fun and make racist remarks about Jews um, that you wouldn't be allowed to today. And I felt it very bitterly, all the uh, jibes and all the uh, anti-Semitic Jewish jokes, the racist jokes, um, and very often I'd had fights in school and in the army. Um, and in the end I decided, well, it's not worth it. And um, I didn't talk about it. Um, and in, uh, some people did, some of my best friends didn't even know that I was Jewish. Um, and this persisted right through to my army days when, again, I was picked on for being Jewish and I had to fight my way out I, in order to survive and uh, gain um, some kind of respect, I had to fight someone um, because he called me all sorts of things and he was very anti-Semitic towards me. Immediately after the Second World War, the Holocaust was not the centre of attention as may have been expected. Because not long after the war had ended, East and West, Communism and Capitalism became embroiled in a worldwide struggle that would shape the latter half of the 20th century. What's most interesting in this period is the way in which the Holocaust was viewed in both capitalist and communist countries. For example, East and West Germany had differing outlooks on the Holocaust. Well, in East Germany, the German Democratic Republic, which existed as did West Germany as of 1949, the Holocaust was not remembered to the same degree, I think, as it was in West Germany. I think that would be a fair comment, even though that memory set in in West Germany quite late. In East Germany, it has been argued by some critics, indeed, there was no memory of the Holocaust. I think that's not true. There was. But for the East Germans, the argument was that capitalism was the essential root of the Nazi evil, and anti-Semitism was a tool that had been used by the capitalists in their war against um, socialism rather than something distinct and special. So it tended to get seen as a subcategory of capitalist evil rather than taken for the racist and very specific atrocity that it was. The East Germans tended to blame the West Germans for, uh, if not for the Holocaust, then at least for having given a new home to many of those SS men and others who were involved in perpetrating the Holocaust. and so. The East Germans were constantly producing books or writing newspaper articles trying to demonstrate that the Nazis were all living in the West and the West Germans were not prosecuting them. They were making no effort to deal with them. Um, the classic case um, was probably of a guy called Hans Globke who was secretary to Adenauer and the East Germans um, found out, or didn't find out, but they highlighted the fact that uh, he had been responsible for providing a gloss to the Nuremberg race laws in 1935, uh, and so therefore was surely untenable as any kind of political advisor, and yet he remained in office. So the West, the East German tendency was to blame the West Germans for not facing the Nazi past, for offering continuity to SS men, for instance, and generally for being a neo-fascist state. It all seemed to add up in their own imagination. Whereas the West Germans um, tended to blame the East Germans, if not for National Socialism, then they pointed out that East Germany was a totalitarian state, it was a dictatorship, people had no freedom, people had no rights, and so essentially, you know, the GDR was a continuation of Nazism 
under a different name. This time they called it socialism rather than national socialism. And so it was quite easy, I think, for both countries to blame the other country for representing in some sense a continuity of Nazism uh, and by doing so deflect blame and responsibility. At Auschwitz-Birkenau, the students we saw earlier on their visit are now leaving the site. Their silhouettes make their way through the lights and eventually through the gates of the camp itself. These students can leave Auschwitz. But there were thousands who perished here. They never had that freedom. And perhaps this visit and many others like it serve as a reminder to future generations so that these people may ensure that such atrocities do not happen again. But all the time when I was in Britain, when I was in primary school, when I was in secondary school, when I was in grammar school, when I was in the army, when I was at college, when I was an, a civil engineer, when I was a teacher, I never told anyone my story like I've just told you now. Until about 14, 15 years ago. Um, 15 years ago, someone told me about Beth Shalom, the Holocaust Memorial Centre, this place. So I came to have a look, I was very impressed. And I came back the following week, clutching my father's manuscript because my father, over the years of the ghetto and even before the ghetto and certainly in hiding, he was writing a diary of events that happened and he finished up with a 41 page manuscript. I showed it to Stephen Smith who created this wonderful place, he and his family, the Smith family. Um, he was very impressed, uh, asked me to write a book. I finished up writing 10 pages in a much larger book, but I offered to come and help out as much as possible here. And I, eventually I finished up by telling my story as I've told you now. At the Holocaust Center in Laxton, there is a sculpture called Hidden Childhood, donated by Simon. It is dedicated in memory of the Jews of Radzivilov. Yes, uh, the sculpture was actually sculpted by a dear friend of mine, uh, Stanley Bullard, that I remember Stanley mooting the idea um, to um, construct a sculpture in Beth Shalom um, to commemorate my uh, hiding. Beth Shalom, we know we have a memorial centre not so far from here at Laxton. Um, we know that the Imperial War Museum has a very, very good exhibition on the Holocaust. We know there are, in Britain now, Holocaust memorials. So the, 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 just to take one example, the uh, children who came over here, the Jewish children, as part of the so-called child transport or kinder transport, these, are, these children who were rescued, there are memorials to these children as well. So the topic is important in Britain. We remember it regularly on the 27th of January every year. Usually, the political leader of the country will make some sort of comment on that day, or if not the leader, then um, others who are important. And that's the case all around Europe, mostly anyway. Uh, Auschwitz Liberation Day has become a day when we, politicians and people generally, remember the Holocaust. So, as I said, I don't want to talk about myself. I'll talk about the fact that in European memory, Auschwitz, the Holocaust, has now a firm place. And we remember it always in these contexts as a warning against other genocides or atrocities, which may not be genocidal in character, but nevertheless atrocities for all that. Whether remembering the Holocaust in this way as a warning is effective or not is another matter. But the idea behind it definitely is to generate awareness and make us sensitive to what might be happening around us today. Did that stop what happened in Rwanda? No. Did it stop what happened in Yugoslavia? Probably not. Is it stopping what happened in Sudan? Probably not. Uh, remembering the Holocaust could be seen as an empty ritual in such cases. Well-meaning, no doubt, but ultimately ineffective, back to the idea of effectiveness in terms of memory. There's also the argument that countries in remembering the Holocaust have a very good means at their disposal of forgetting their own crimes. And I would say in the case of the British, this is particularly problematic. Um, Britain still has a very heroic memory of its own history. And while I don't want to say that they, we don't have a right to think of our history in that terms, uh, 
in those terms, we ought to be aware more of the shadowy sides to our history. And when we remember the Holocaust, we don't normally remember what we did to the Irish or what we did to the Indians. Um, it's generally thought of in terms of that terrible Nazi atrocity. The Germans have still kind of emblematic for all that went wrong in European history. From that point of view, remembering the Holocaust is not something that is necessarily good. It's good to remember it in itself, but it's not good to use it as a way of not remembering something else. Um, from my own personal point of view, um, remembering the Holocaust is something that is connected to my father, because my father was involved in the liberation of prisoner of war camps in the Far East, uh, where British prisoners and others have been held. He witnessed atrocities there that he never talked about, but when he came back to Britain after the war and set up a family, he retained an interest in the Second World War and he passed that on to me. And he developed an interest in the Holocaust. This was the extraordinary thing. Although he didn't, um, you know, although Jews were never really a topic in our family, but he'd had this interest in the Holocaust and he passed on a huge book to me by Martin Gilpis about the Holocaust, which was a classic at the time and it still is. Um, and I wondered why he was so interested in, in, in this. And um, I never really knew much about what he'd experienced when he liberated the camps in the Far East until he died. And then my mother told me more about it. And I think in reading about the Holocaust, he'd learned something about what had happened in the Far East as well, because at that time there wasn't that much information on the uh, Far East. At least my father wasn't able to get hold of it. So there I think remembering the Holocaust was helpful perhaps for remembering another atroc atrocity. It helped my father perhaps to understand what had happened in the Far East. So um, remembering the Holocaust in relation to another atrocity can be helpful, can be productive, and it certainly was for him. And he passed on my interest in the subject, it's his interest in the subject to me. I think I definitely got it from him. So that's the personal angle. And yes, of course, I think we should go on remembering the Holocaust. And so we have covered briefly the events of the Holocaust. And we should take note of what happened during those dark times. Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda, amongst others. These countries too have borne witness to genocide since the Holocaust. It is clear that we have much to learn. We must learn from our past if we wish to create a brighter future. In a moment you'll be listening to a message from Simon Winston, which he gave during his interview. The message tells us what we can learn from his experiences. The past echoes here today in the present, and those who died in the Holocaust left their footprints in the snow. They left their mark on our world and on our conscience. Let us go forward, but let us never forget. People are different. They may be different because of their religion, they may be different because of their race, um, they may be different simply because of the colour of their skin. They may be different because of their beliefs or their lifestyles. Don't pick on people simply because they're different. Because that leads to discrimination, prejudice and later to abuse. And eventually it could lead to genocide. Don't pick on people because they're different. <laughs>